I'm very, very happy to be here today. Um, as you have heard, I do have a background in the games industry. I hadn't really worked in the, game indus in the games industry for a few years. So it is very exciting for me to be uh, at this particular event, and I want to thank uh, the organizers for their invitation. There's a few Googlers as well, kind of presenting over the three days of the conference. Um, so please make sure that you come up to us, you introduce yourself. Uh, we would very much like to, to meet you. I do have to do a kind of a bit of a warning, especially for the uh, presenters after me. Um, as I'm sorry to say, Shangri-La is a great facility, but this projector was invented in the 20th century. Some of the text in my presentation was almost impossible to, be, to make readable. Right. So if you're presenting after me, you might want to take a look at your presentation and make your test as big as possible. That's kind of disclaimer before you come up here. And for the rest, I will just read some of the things that I was hoping you to read on your own. Um, I, will, I will do like with my seven-year-old son, and I will read them out to you. So my name is Sergio, and I lead games partnerships at Google. Uh, as it usually happens with Google, though, the title itself requires some explanation. I guess we're not particularly good at coming up with titles that explain what we do. But what me and my team do is um, we actually work with games developers and publishers uh, to help them learn more about the Google ecosystem of products that help them grow their business, develop the right strategies to use them, make sure the right conversations are taking place with the right people, and finally, specifically, help them grow their business. Now today I would like to take a few minutes to talk about the challenges that are faced by the games industry and the solutions that Google is proposing so that you can overcome those challenges. Now some of those challenges are recognized and to a certain extent have existed for many years. Those that ha are somewhat veteran in the games industry will know that you know, challenges with development tools, integration of those tools, distribution channels, competition, etc. But I think it's fair to say that in the, last, um, in the last two years or so, the games industry has changed more than in the previous 10 years. Um, now, what this has, ha has uh, created is lower barriers to entry, but also because of that reason, there's um, increasing challenges that are faced by those that decide to come into the games industry. Um, move, the move towards mobile platforms, for example, a level of fragmentation unheard of before, increasingly global markets, there's no such thing as a local market anymore once you move into mobile, for example. Competition from incumbents and new entrants, and technology challenging, technologically challenging requirements that usually have, have nothing to do with the creation of the game itself. Other challenges include levels, low levels of engagement. We all know the numbers, but around 66% of mobile games are never played after the first 24 hours. Now that's a very, little, a very low level of engagement for a product into which you have put a lot of time and effort. But also things like incredibly small num numbers of paying customers. Again, we have all heard the statistics, maybe one to 5% of customers actually ever play in those games that use some kind of freemium business model. In markets as huge as console games, online games, and the more new but fastest growing mobile games market, there's only a few makers of premium games which see real success. And we all know the names the kings and supercells of this world. But the reality is that there is only one king and there's only one supercell. With the exception of one-time wonders like Flappy Bird or 2048, those successful players tend to be larger companies with resources that they can devote to a large number of activities that actually have nothing to do with the development of the game itself. But at the end of the day, no matter how big or small, every developer has the same question. How do I make the best games possible and generate as much revenue from them for as long as possible? Anyone here who doesn't have this, same, this question? Silence is compliance. Let's just assume that you all said yes. If anyone is thinking no, you're probably a charity. Now, it used to be relatively easy kind of to monetize games, right? To sell and monetize games. Now, the process of distributing and making money from games um, many years ago was cumbersome and slow, but it was pretty straightforward, especially in the case of arcade machines. You would go in there, put your coin, play for a while, right? and I used to spend hours with Double Dragon, for example, many, many years ago. Um, at, you know, at the end of the week, there would be a guy coming in a lorry with a big bag. He would put the coins in the bag, and he would take the coins away. That's it. That was the business model. But the, in the era of digital, things got a little bit more complicated. 
Now, see, so if your objective, as we have established, is to generate as much revenue as possible to continue funding the creation of ever better games, what is the best way to do it? Today, there's many ways to monetize your game, especially on the mobile platform. But in reality, many of these business models apply to console games to a certain extent, and also to online games. These are the basic monetiz monetization methods. Um, however, things are never black, on, black or white. Right? And it's unlikely that you'll be able to grow your business just choosing one of these monetiz monetization methods over, over another. Let's take a look at some numbers. Um, and I would like us to focus for a moment in the paid versus free apps discussion. And I think these numbers, yeah, you can, you can sort of read them, right? Now, which one is better, right? This is, uh, by the way, for the overall apps market, not just games. In reality, each app is a different world, and the audience is different. However, if we look at the trends in the market, and these are, these are from Garner, we can see that the paid download model will become much smaller in the next few years. You can still get the odd game nowadays where you pay up front. And as is my case, for example, a couple of weeks ago, I decided to fork 12.95 Singapore dollars for Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition. I'm having a total blast with it. But those type of uh, payment methods, and especially the amount that I paid for it, is actually becoming the exception and not the norm. Now, this is probably not news to many of you, right? You live and breathe your games. You live and breathe the games industry. And you, you, you sort of know these data instinctively, right? But it's good to have the validation from a company like Garner. Now, I think this is the one that I have to read to you, right? Um, so those uh, bars in here represent four different countries, United States, United Kingdom, France, and Germany. And the big bars represent um, the number of users that download free apps only. And the numbers should say 54, 53, 72, and 53. We actually did some research where we asked the users about app usage habits in general. And this is just one of the many interesting insights we got from the research. We can see the majority of the users only download free apps. And this is data from mature markets in the US and Europe. We know, because we, we, most of us work in one way or another with emerging markets, that in emerging markets, the percentage of users that download only free apps is even higher than this. And those apps that are not necessarily free in emerging markets tend to be free for different reasons. Over half of, you, of the users we surveyed said they will only ever download free apps. They will not pay for apps. So we're seeing a trend here. We are firmly moving away from what I'm calling the first app economy, which was predominantly focused on paying for apps up front, to a second app economy. And this is the era of free apps and incremental payments. Now, you will not be surprised that in, in terms of games, in-app purchases is where most of the money goes. And again, these bars here are for the same countries as before, the US, the UK, France and Germany. The numbers are actually much higher here. 89, 94, 88, 94. As part of this app research we conducted, we asked users, in the past 30 days, when you've spent money on gaming apps, has it been for a paid download, an in-game purchase, or something else? And you can see that in-app purchase significantly dominates, averaging 91% of a spend across these four European markets. By the way, the presentation will be made available afterwards. So if you didn't catch kind of the names of the countries or the data, you can get it from the, from the website. Now, some of you will have seen this type of graph before, right? That is the, there are the mythical whales at the very top, right? That everybody's striving to get. And we have so killer whales, whales, dolphins, minnows and non-payers, right? And you can sort of read this one. If you focus specifically on games, as I say, in a purchase is a dominant business model. But how many users actually do you spend and how much? Well, it's difficult to define the number, but generally speaking, at least in conversations with developers that I have, I am told that at the very, very, very highest level, maybe two, three percent of users pay through in-app purchases, if you're lucky. 
And in the last uh, six, six weeks or so, I've been twice to China. And I was being told by Chinese developers that that number is actually around 1%. Now, this over-reliance on inner purchases as a business model has led to a strange situation. It turns out that only the top 150 developers in both the Play Store and the App Store actually make real money, leaving everybody else fighting over the smallest share of the total revenue. And the top 10 grossing charts are dominated by an unchanging group of huge titles that do little more than trade their relative positions of dominance. To the users, to the general public, those cute grinding games that are clones of each other seem like the best the industry has to offer and continue to, to, to reap the vast majority of the rewards. And this situation has been created by that over-reliance of the in purchase model. Now, the free-to-play model itself actually serves a million users to developers and gamers. Now, I have put myself lots of time and money into Asphalt 8. Anyone from uh, Gameloft here? Thank you very much for the game, but really, I, I think I subsidize a significant amount of Asphalt 9. So I hope it will be really, really good. Now, the, the in-app purchase model itself is not the problem, but the model in isolation is not perfect, and it does need to evolve to create a more level playing field among developers. In the past months, we've learned that among our partners, Google partners, Google Games partners, the ones leading the way, um, uh, so the most successful partners are the ones leading the way kind of in combining different monetization methods that until now have been sort of kept separate. Now, what does that evolution look like? Um, this is a very simple but quite an insightful graph. We did an analysis among game app developers who are generating more than 10 million downloads per month and compare the value they are getting per download depending on what business model they adopt. So the bars in here say ads, combination, inner purchases. What we discover is that game developers that are combining both inner purchases and ads are getting more than double the revenue per download than the developers only focusing on inner purchases and much more than the developers using ads. Now, with data in hand, our vision for game developers is of an ecosystem of tools and services that provide the means to easily integrate total monetization solutions that empower you to maximize the returns of your investments and ensure that you can devote most of your time doing what you do best, which is to make great games. This ecosystem, at the very, very minimum, must provide you the tools to manage and understand what your users are doing and once this happens, give you the ability to monetize those users in the right way. For example, if they are paying users, and we have data that shows that if a user does not pay for the first 30 days, they will never buy anything in your game, right? But if they happen to be kind of buying users, you should be given the tools to ensure that you maximize those returns, that you maximize the amount of revenue per user that you're getting through in-app purchases. But if they're not going to ever buy anything from you, uh, you should be able to monetize those users in a different way, this time through advertising that is premium in nature and that integrates well with the user experience. And everybody knows that traditionally, advertising in games has been a not very good experience. Ultimately, you have to ask yourselves, how comfortable am I with monetizing only 2% of my users. How comfortable I am, am I that 92% of my users are not paying anything for a product that it has cost me a lot of time and money to produce? Now, at Google, we don't want to define which model is best for you. What we do offer is a dialogue to help you define your model and help you execute on your decision supporting the growth of your business with the right tools. An example of Google's commitment to games is AdMob, our mobile advertising and monetization network. Um, AdMob actually connects you with um, over one million mobile advertisers. It delivers another one million advertisers through AdWords integration. Right now, more than 650,000 apps use AdMob to monetize. 
and we have recently launched an improved version of our integration with the Unity game engine, which means you can access three million more developers. Most importantly, in order to realize our vision of how we can support you, the latest version of AdMob, which is now available, provides access to several tools in the same SDK. Google Analytics is now directly available in AdMob. In addition to that, also available in AdMob is in-app purchase ads to help you maximize your revenue from in-app purchase users. And as a final bonus, you have access to ad network optimization and also live CPM, which are essential tools to optimize the revenue from advertising. App developers using AdMob ad network optimization have seen a 15 to 20% increase in revenue. These are three tools available, as I say, through the one single SDK. On top of this, you have access to the App Developer Business Kit. It's a website with a, with a significant amount of tools, case studies, suggestions, and advice on best practice for development and monetization of apps and games. As an all-encompassing monetization platform for mobile games, AdMob delivers significant returns to empower you to focus on what you do best. This is just the beginning of how our vision transforms, translates into reality. But this is just the beginning, as I say. And we do want to partner with you guys, to talk to you, to establish a dialogue, to know what else needs to be done so that we can deliver, so that we can develop the tools that are going to help you grow your business. Ultimately, the current flawed business models need to evolve so that the industry can evolve as well. Your game is the key component of the business that you are building. It will always be. At the end of the day, it is your content. For everything else, right, find the right partner. The world continues to get more and more complicated for game developers. And there are several questions that you have to consider. And I'm sure you ask yourselves these questions pretty much every day. How do I build a backend that scales with the growth of my business? Where and how do I distribute my game? What is the best user acquisition method? How do I understand how my players are using my game? Do I sell my game? Do I use an emerging business model to earn revenue? As I mentioned at the beginning, my job and the job of my team at Google, and I can see Vinit from my team sitting right here in the second row. He promised to cheer for me. Thank you, Vinit. <laughs> Please meet him. Um, our job is to empower you by providing Google's ecosystem of the latest technologies and products to help you build and scale your game. Distribute, distribute your game to as many users as possible, engage with your players, and receive the value that you deserve from 100% of your users, not just 1%. In short, me and my team, and you will meet some of them over the course of the, of the conference, are ready, to turn your, are ready to help you turn your app, turn your game, into a growing and thriving business. Now, if you want to know more, you can go to developers.google.com, or if you're feeling like it, I was hoping to get the award for the largest QR code in the conference. <laughs> Am I getting it? Rachel, what do you think? Oh, no, she's busy. Well, I'm hoping I get it. Vote for me. Vote for my QR code, please. It takes you to developers.google.com. You can get a lot more information about this there, right? But ultimately, please do come to us. Uh, let's have a chat. Uh, tomorrow, the last um, presentation is actually by Bob Mees, who does business development for the, for the play team, uh, coming directly from California. And there's a few more presentations on the, on the Thursday that are more oriented to developers. So please, let's have a chat. Um, come on over. Um, and I hope um, you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you very much, guys. OK, okay. so I'm being asked if I can do a Q&A. Come over here. Yeah. I think uh, I'll say yes if you let me take a picture. Okay. Is that fair? Can I take a picture of you guys, and then we can do questions? OK, thank you. OK, that's a bad place for a picture. All right. A smile, uh, please. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> OK, any questions from the audience? <clears throat> Uh, my name is Anil Vanwari. Anil, how are you? From Animation Express in India. Just curious, uh, 
uh, what kind of trends do you see a polarization amongst large game studios and smaller boutiques coming in in the future or do you see uh, you know what, what trends do you see on that front so 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 the question is what trends do i see um, in, in, in terms, terms of, of yeah in games terms. studios and uh, and and smaller niche players who are coming in do you see uh, okay. any trends in that area okay um what we're seeing is and this should not surprise anyone i think what basically happens in pretty much every industry I think the, the larger games studios have a, enormous resources and great ability to continue, and don't take this the wrong way, right? but to continue milking the, the type of business that they have been able to build. They are able to deploy resources that are not only oriented to kind of building their games, but also do everything around it. We all know how difficult acquisition has become, right? Analytics. Around, around the, the development of the game, we have a significant amount of data analysis that is needed nowadays. And those are larger studios are clearly kind of being able to kind of double down on that type of business and continue growing from there. What I think is a slightly more difficult for them is innovation. Um, I see much more innovation going on with the smaller studios. Right? Uh, unfortunately for them, what happens is what I briefly mentioned low barriers to entry. Nowadays, anyone who can code can build a mobile game, right? Flappy Bird, our friend Dong Wen from Vietnam. Just one guy who actually does game development at night after he finishes his, his work day, right? Fantastic for him, but barriers to entry is easy. He was successful, but for the majority of smaller developers, this doesn't happen, even though they have the ability to innovate. I think my re a recommendation I, I would have, right, is for those are the, stu the, the, the type of kind of small businesses that can bring innovation across um, smartphones, tablets, but also looking at things like wearables or VR technology. Right? Since being successful right now in the industry as is, is very difficult, so you can get in, but it's very difficult to be really successful in the industry. Looking at the future technologies, looking at the future platforms, can be an interesting way of continuing innovating and sort of sidestep the challenges with the larger players right, and establish themselves in a, in a platform, in a format that is not successful quite yet. I hope that answers your question. Do we have time for? I'm afraid not. That's not? Okay. Well, I'll be around the rest of the day, so please say hello. And thank you very much for your attention, guys.